Good morning. So this morning, as you can probably tell, I'm going to be talking about money. Um, thank you for your prayer, Joel, this morning uh, for the collection. Uh, this lesson, as you notice, is after the collection. It's not going to be about tithing. It's not going to be about the collection. It could be. Um, but after I was studying Malachi and was thinking about some of the lessons towards the heart that that brought up, I wanted to talk about money in an aspect for us to think about our hearts. Um, so let's keep our hearts open as we study money in the scriptures. Um, generally, when I try to think about what to talk about, I think about what's, what would be helpful for me. Um, and something that I wanted to study was money and how that falls within God's word and what God says about money. So you can see 100%, that's everyone, and that's 100% of people have to figure out a way to deal with money. As adults, that's every single day, whether that's the house we live in, uh, food that we shop for, transportation, or even just the expensive gas so that our transportation can move. Um, there's tons of people in the world around us that we can listen to who will gladly talk about money and gladly give you advice. And some of these people are wise, but a lot of these people are fools, and we need to be careful what we listen to about money especially in the world today. So the point of today is to not look at man's wisdom regarding money. Uh, we're going to see what God has to say about that, and we're going to look into his scripture. Uh, money is a very large topic, and uh, this is definitely not going to be an exhaustive study. I don't think you guys want to listen to an exhaustive study on money, and I know my voice won't last that long. So... Um, just uh, we'll look at some scriptures and see what they have to say um, and look at our hearts. One of the first things that I noticed looking about money is contentment and the attitude we should have of contentment. First scripture we'll take a look at is going to be Proverbs chapter 11. You can go ahead and turn there. Proverbs 11, we'll read verse 24. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. When we look at this and see the examples in the world around us, we can see that this is very true. When we give, we receive. Not monetarily most of the time, but especially when we look spiritually, and when we help those around us, or help God's work in his kingdom. Uh, choosing not to give only makes us want more. What millionaire or billionaire out there do you know is happy with the amount of money that they have? I think if you hear the attitudes of most of them, um, and even people who aren't millionaires, most people with a lot of money are always seeking ways to grow that money, and it only leads to more discontentment. We often hear by the world how great it is to have possessions, to be rich, to be wealthy. Alternatively, though, let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we'll be starting in verse 10. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income, which is all. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them uh, with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches are kept by their owner to his hurt, 
and those riches were lost in a bad venture, and he is our and he is father of a son, and he has nothing in his hand. As he comes from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Uh, just as he came, he shall go. And what gain is there to him who toils for, for the wind? Moreover, all his days he he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. We can see that the love of money and the love of wealth is vain. How riches kept by their owner are to their own hurt. We know that as we come into this world with nothing, uh, we'll go out of this world with nothing as well. We, we can't keep the possessions we have here. And we can see that riches cause vexation, sickness, and anger. It's a very different perspective from what you hear from a lot of people in the world today. Next, we'll be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and to many into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Uh, Once again, we see in this scripture that anything, or we didn't bring anything into this world and we can't take anything with us. Uh, All we need to be content is food and clothing. And we can see the destruction that can come from people desiring to be rich, how the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We need to be careful because it has caused people to leave the faith. We hear from the world the importance of generating wealth, of prospering and not having to worry, setting yourself up for success. And that's, that's not what we've seen in these scriptures. We need to heed the warnings given to us The love of money, once again, has caused people to leave the faith. Uh, We can see the issues Ty mentioned in class about the rich young ruler, um, how Jesus loved him, told him he needed to sell his possessions, and yet he went away sad. By ignoring God's teachings, we can make our own lives miserable and possibly, once again, lose our souls. So summary of this contentment, contentment section Um, I'll once again read this uh, scripture that Melvin read this morning, Hebrews chapter 13, 5 through 6. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's make sure that we're content and be wary of the love of money. The next thing I noticed as I was uh, studying money is where do we store our treasures up? Uh, We'll look first at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 19. And that says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, uh, to be rich in good works, to be generous and to be and ready to share. Thus, 
storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We see that we're not supposed to hope in riches, but we're supposed to hope in God. This mentions storing up treasures, and that's not keeping gold buried in the dirt or how much you have saved up in the bank. But instead, the treasures it's talking about is being rich in good works and being generous, uh, focusing on uh, what true life is and storing up treasures there instead of just fading possessions. Uh, next, we'll read for Matthew chapter 6, 19 and 21, 19 through 21. Matthew six nineteen through 21. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a pretty straightforward passage. Most of you are probably familiar with it. And we can think to ourselves, um, what's the point of storing earthly treasures? When this passage talks about rust, I think back to where I work at. And you can see people's livelihoods are invested in semi-trucks. And um, some of these can be very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet you can have a brand new semi-truck that you invest in, um, that some people place their livelihoods on. And yeah, that could still come with some surface rust. Or it could come with a sensor bad from the factory. And it, this is, isn't just an issue with a fancy object like that, but anything you think about, any object here, nothing's, nothing's perfect. And anything that's left long enough to nature is going to be destroyed. Um, and it's important to think that what are, we, what are we prioritizing? What are we thinking as important? Um, another thing to think about this is it warns where our treasures are is where our heart is. What do we invest in? Are we investing in spiritual things or are we investing in earthly things? Um, you can think about your favorite sports team. Uh, for me, I'm a Steelers fan. I'm invested in the Steelers. You wouldn't catch me dead in a Baltimore Ravens outfit. That's, that's not me. That's not what I'm invested in. What are we invested in? Are we spiritually invested? Or are we invested in physical aspects? And then where are uh, where we're invested in is where our heart is. Next, we'll be reading from James chapter 5. We'll read the first six verses of James 5. That says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last day. Behold the wages of your laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence and have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have commended and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. You can see the miseries are coming upon the rich, that their earthly riches, what they're invested in, is going to be destroyed. You can also see that the Lord of hosts takes note. He pays attention. He listens. It's very frequent in the world we live in that most people who are 
become rich or have lots of riches. Um, generally, it's through mistreating people, through cheating people. We know that God is judged and he watches for things such as this. Looks like I flipped the verses on the screen. Uh, next, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who has made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, uh, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plenty. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. And God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So to the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. One's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. We also don't, don't know what day is going to be our last. We don't want to be the fool who tries to plan out our whole lives. Only God knows what day will be our last. We need to be ready and prepared at all times to meet God. The next attitude I saw that we need to have is that everything here is already God's. We can see that in Psalms uh, chapter 50. Psalms 50, starting in verse 7 through 15. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continual, continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer, a offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble that I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. We'll also read verse 23 of the same chapter. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders... Uh, his ways, his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. It's clear that God doesn't need anything from us. Everything is already his. And we need to be careful of our attitude when we are giving to God. Um, we need to know it's already his, and he's allowing us to use it. It's not the other way around. Uh, we need to be thankful to God for what he has given us. And we need to have pleasing sacrifices to God, both physically, but also, more importantly, spiritual sacrifices. If you remember from our study in Malachi, the uh, Sunday and last, Wednesday, or last Sunday and Wednesday, uh, we could see how the offerings at that time from Judah were not accepted by God. Uh, God re referenced the sacrifices of old and how those were pleasing. Uh, one of these uh, offerings we can see in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And I'll read verses 9 through 17. It 
2 Chronicles 29, 9 through 17. And that says, I wrote down the wrong verse. Yes, 1 Chronicles. There we are. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 9 through 17. And the people, or then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the, in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and you... And of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, and all our fathers were, or as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you have tested the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now you have, and now I have seen your people who are presently here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, our fathers uh, kept forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of the people and directed their hearts towards you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build a palace for which I have made provision. This attitude we see... Uh, David speaking here. This attitude is the attitude that Judah needed. Uh, you can see previously, I didn't read all the things that they were giving to God. Uh, it's a lot. But their attitude isn't a worldly perspective. Uh, they aren't concerned about how much they're giving up, but instead they're seeing that it's already God's and they're just giving it back to him. They're not greedy and they're not proud of what they're offering to God. Next, we'll read from Luke chapter 16. We'll read the first 13 verses here. He said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that the man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, and you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses." So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. 
The master commended the, dis- the, the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in uh, dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into their earthly dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful, or yeah, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devote to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In this uh, section, we can see um, if we can't be trusted with little, how is someone going to trust us with more? If we can't be trusted with physical riches, how, how will we be trusted with true riches? If we can't be trusted with someone else's money, how can we be trusted with our own? Verse 13, uh, we'll go ahead and read that one again. It says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As we think to ourselves, we need to think which master we're going to serve. The short sighted joy possible joy of riches, and as we've covered before, that's very false and causes more issues. But riches that cause destruction, or are we going to seek true riches, God's truth and God's word? The option is ours. We need to decide ourselves which one we're going to serve. It's clear we cannot serve both. I mentioned before about how God knows our hearts. Uh, We're going to cover three other shorter lessons. um, And with these individuals, we're going to look at lessons that we can learn from them. Uh, The first one's going to be in Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. Most of you are probably familiar with this. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people were putting in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all than all those who are contributing uh, to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty, uh, has put in everything she, she had, all she had to live on. With this widow, we can see that she gave her all. We can see her heart as she was giving it all. Uh, She wasn't withholding anything for herself. Uh, She was trusting. She didn't say to herself, well, I can't give this right now because how else will I eat? Or how else will I live? We can see that she just had the attitude of giving. We can also see that it's easy to compare monetary values um, with giving and with generosity, God doesn't just see that. There's, there's a point of uh, how much we give that he sees, and it's not just tied to monetary values. She gave out of her poorness while everyone else was giving more out of their abundance. 
That's why Jesus says that she gave the most. Speaking about Jesus, uh, we'll be talking about him. I could talk a lot more about him, but we'll just read from Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 20. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to, uh, to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will go follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. When you're looking at money and possessions, we can see where Jesus' priorities were. To be blunt, they were not on physical possessions. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. The King of Kings and the Son of God didn't prioritize that. Instead, you can continue reading the Gospels and see everything that he did prioritize, teaching and healing and helping others. It's an important lesson for us to remember what Jesus prioritized. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about a wee little man. And yes, that's Zacchaeus. Uh, we'll read his story again in Luke chapter 19. That's going to be verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, and, uh, he could not, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to, and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when he saw it, they or and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anything, anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was a very rich man, and yet he didn't care about his status or his riches. He still sought Jesus. He wasn't embarrassed to climb a tree because his priority wasn't his status but it was Jesus. Money was not Zacchaeus's priority. Looks like it was before in his life. But after meeting Jesus, we see a change. Donating his money to the poor and restoring money to those who he had wronged. When we look at these examples, we can ask ourselves, what's important to us? Is a love of money or a love of possessions preventing you from serving God? Are you tied down by want? Are you seeking riches that are just going to fade someday? I ask you to consider and contemplate these things. We all have to deal with money in our life, but it's our choice whether we're going to serve God or if we're going to serve money. And the choice is yours of who you're going to serve. Money is only one aspect of our spiritual walk with God. But today, if you realize that you need to make a change, uh, that you need to prioritize our God and our Savior, who died on a cross, who died on a cross to save us, that I ask you to please come forward. We'd be glad to study with you, to pray with you, to talk to you. We'd be thrilled to baptize you.
if you choose to follow Jesus' command and become a disciple of his. We ask you to consider these things as we go ahead and sing song number 611.